that creative drive and passion that I live on, um, it wasn't, wasn't ever going to work. It wasn't going to give me what I needed. So I sacked it off and I set up on my own, 1979. And uh, I've been looking for a proper job ever since. <laughs> Doubts from my dad, really. My dad uh, was a happy hobbyist. We spent a lot of time as little, well, when I was a little lad. Uh, and dad loved to take pictures. It was a big gig um, with my family at the time. Um, everything was documented. And um, dad did uh, a lot of home printing, had a home dark room and all that kind of stuff. We used to go down to the little uh, horse field and take some pictures of the horses, the animals, then we'd go back and dev them all up and do small contact prints and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it goes back really, for me, Dad gave me my first camera when I was eight, um, and that was the first proper camera, which was a Kodak Brownie. My mum and Dad's background was, my mum was a true East Ender, um, and they met. Dad was a projectionist, a uh, cinema projectionist. Mum was an usherette, which is how they met. So film had always been a massive part of my upbringing. Uh, and the influences of like film noir, you know, the, the traditional best films ever made, the British black and whites, propaganda films, John Mills, the war films, that kind of stuff. You know, the kind of um, Philip Marlowe gigs, that type of stuff was a massive, massive influence on me. Have you got a favorite cover? No, I haven't shot it yet. It's the next one. It's always the next one, is always it? Always the next one. Always move a line. The line moves all the time for me. It, I never reach that place. It's That's a, just another step on and another exercise, another project, another shot, whatever it is. But I never get to where I'm, where I'm going. To be honest, I don't really know where the fuck I'm going anyway. <laughs> you know, it's one of these things that discovering what you want to do and where you really need to be in life, creatively in my case. What makes Nick Elliott tick then? Emotion. That's what makes Nick Elliott tick. It's the only thing, it's the only fool that's in my fire. And a uh, little strange, a little strange, really. Everything I do is emotionally driven, certainly professionally, yeah, artistically. Um, I'm a very deep person, very emotional person, very sexual person, you know, and all these various different emotions that we've all got, they all feature heavily in the work that I'm now doing. So that sums it up really, Andy, uh, to be honest, that's exactly what I'm about. That's what makes it all work, you know, all work. Well, I first met Nick when we went to school together at Stangerand. I think it was comprehensive, but I'm not absolutely certain. It was then. It was. It was. Yeah, that's when we first met. That's when I first met Nick. Um, and um, he, I mean, Nick's no bloody good at sport. Absolutely no good. At it. We used to go cross-country running, but we used to jog around by his mum's. But me and Nick would get on the end of the queue and go in his mum's for a cup of tea and a bacon sandwich. <laughs> and then we'd sit out, we'd look out the window and, and when we saw him coming back up, we'd peel out the back of his mum's house and get on the back of it again. And they didn't even know we <laughs> hadn't been there. So they'd run all, I mean, they'd probably done, I don't know, three, four miles, I don't know what they'd done. Me and Nick had had a cup of tea. <laughs> When he was a, a teenager, he used to like his pop music and... In the bedroom. Um, no earphones in those days, so, you know, it was... Uh, we all shared the music. <laughs> <laughs> I've never forgot where I come from, and I come from 51. Okay. You know, that's where yeah, I come from. It's up, isn't it? Stand ground, it's, you know, it's, East End. It's nice that you're grounded, isn't it, as well? Well... I suppose some people 
Yeah. That's important they, to me, Jess. It's know, important not. to me. It is, you know, the people, because even even you two, you know, it, it's it's gone to make me the person that I am today. Mm. You don't you don't ex, you don't expect you don't think of people being uh, rock star artists or whatever it is photographers, but uh, mm -hmm. I think you're doing pretty well. Yeah. And to well me done. now, I've taken one or two photographs of him. He definitely looks like a rock star. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt about it. Because, you know, you have neighbours, you have friends, don't you? And I know Scylla was very close to my mum, you know, and yeah. that kind of, you know, I mean, I, I still miss 51. I miss my mum and dad and my family and, and everything we had here. Best times ever. It was. We went to school together and... Yeah, still got the privet. My dad printed Dad, Dad planted that privet. And that is the original sign that my dad put up. Yeah, and the light, oh. and the hanging basket from it. They were Dad's. Stand Ground Academy, they call it now. Oh, I can't remember the year. It would have been the early 70s. And he was at that school. He hated that school. I think he was kicked out of there. <laughs> You'll have to ask him that. That's when I first met Nick, and we were into motorbikes at the time. And he he had a Honda, and I wasn't old enough to ride a motorbike, so I used to go on the back of his motorbike. And then as soon as I was 17, I got a GT250, all these famous names, and any excuse to get out and ride your motorbike, uh, preferably flat out, and that was the way to do it. You live here? I was born and, and raised here. Wow. This, this was my family home. Wow. I made that, bugger. All right. I made that at school. I made that at school. No. Holy shit, I remember all this. I used to train there. I used to do weights, catheterics, isometrics on this hill when I was swimming. For God's sakes, man, this is fantastic. What an experience. Oh, how fucking small, isn't it? I never realised how small it was. Bed was here, stereo was here, speakers. Lots of speakers. Jesus, this is wonderful, absolutely wonderful. I'm Nick's younger brother. <laughs> is that much to his disgust? Is <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. I mean, we're we're pretty close. You know, there's just a, a couple of couple of years and a little bit between us, so um, not not much really. Um, we grew up almost being twins, really, in so many different ways. When I think of Nick, you know, there are some traits that you see now that were starting to establish in his very formative years. You know, things like creativity. He was, he was always a fantastic drawer. And they're things that, you know, we try to do together, but my drawing abilities really were limited to stick men and that sort of stuff. But, you know, he was a really, really good artist, illustrator, particularly. You can never open the bloody window. These rubbish are replaced from windows, but you can never open it. You could never open the original. Fucking hell, it's great, man. It's absolutely great. First dark room in here. What's it? First dark room. What, in the bathroom? In the bathroom. Dad set up. Dad used to have... Enlarger was over here. And then we used to wash all the prints underneath. Underneath the enlarger. We did all their prints and stuff. It was done here. And then we eventually kind of... He moved it to here, which was my brother's room. And then got and it. Smaller than what I remember. Fucking hell. He's always been, you know, a, in a way, a bit of a bit of a maverick in a sense. Um, you know, one of the benefits of being the youngest brother is you don't have to break new ground. And 
a real sort of bone of contention um, at, at, at home when we were growing up was you know anything with two wheels was just vetoed uh, but you know based upon good reasons of a parent that it was all about safety um, but Nick was the first one to break cover with his first motorcycle and and I'll never forget it we we'd had some discussions at home and all that sort of stuff and it was pr still a pretty stern line uh, from our parents, particularly from uh, from my mum, and r rather than you know, I, I guess he could see that it, he was he wasn't going to win this battle. Uh, therefore, you know, he needed to take alternative steps. Really, so he went out and bought a bike, and he didn't tell him. Uh, and I'll never forget, we couldn't ride it home. We had to push it from a local uh, sort of area called Yaxley, which was you know, it's a good couple of miles home, uh, and we pushed it. In the, in the black of night, all the way home from Yaxley, and he parked it outside the back door. Uh, we went in, he never said anything, and he just waited for the explosion the following morning. That was typical of him, both about being really, really focused, uh, knowing what the end game is, prepared for the fact that there was going to be some shit on the journey, um, but actually, if you held your nerve and you got there, um, you know, it, it, it was worth it. Next feelings? Oh, God, man. The memories that are here. The memories that were here, that that's obviously still here, but you know, this is this is where it happened, man. This was this was it. This is where it all happened. Yeah, everything started here, 51. Everything. Without this, I wouldn't be the person I am today. N nowhere near. Nowhere near. He lived at 51, and we were at 84, and. Uh, I was just a young teenager. I'm, I'm guessing I was probably about 14 when I first got to know him. And just in passing, passing by their house, and see his cool motorbike. We would um, go around there and help Nick polish his bike and you know do a bit of fettling here and there. Fettling? Yeah, a bit of fettling, you know, but a little bit of work, you know, tighten the chain, blow up the tires. Whatever, whatever needed doing, really. We, we, we were glad to help him. Always seemed a confident chap. Re always really confident back then. I, I really liked that about Nick <clears throat> back then. It was like, yeah, he, he was always confident in what he wanted to do and uh, what he wanted to see and how it just he wanted everything just, just so as well. What was that like good in the house then? <laughs> oh, Christ, I mean, to stand in my bedroom, bloody hell. Fantastic experience. I mean, I come here every year at Christmas and for birthdays for my mum and my dad. And, uh, you know, I just come and I sit and spend 15 minutes, half hour or whatever. <laughs> and he said, when? And I said, now that's a good question. I said it would have to be late late sixties, early late sixties. Seventy one I left. Seventy one. Yeah. yeah. I went far off. Then. Yeah, left seventy one, went straight to the ET. The, the things I remember about you, Nick, when you're at the ET. One, bubbly character. Right. Two, smart dress. Right. Unlike us. Three, and you had other interests outside of what 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 was the sort of newspaper work, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, well, that, that's and you, you, you had a catchphrase. You always <laughs> say, "Catch you later." I still say that. Oh, you do. <laughs> <laughs> I still say that. I remember that. Yeah. Tiny little bit, bit of light. <laughs> bit of light underneath you. That's it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Dave Roberts and Ken Willis. I don't know whether you remember. Yeah, I remember them. Ken Willis. Yeah. Well, sorry. John's on the outside, and he shoulder charged Ken Willis who shoulder-charged Dave Roberts, who shoulder-charged me, and I went straight through this shop window. <laughs> <laughs> and the car, this, this is in Cowgate, uh, and the car was parked in St John's car park, so we, we, I brushed myself down to this glass. We all rushed off down the street into the, into the old GFL 532L, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the old yeah. red yeah. escort, and off. And I guess back to the office, Jack says, ah, oh, son, I'm glad you come back. And I said, what's the problem, Jack? He said, oh, I've got another job for you. I said, come on, Jack. It's, it's bloody 11 o'clock on Christmas Eve. We don't do anything. Oh, look, you know, do this for me, son. I, I, 
What is it? Smash is, window. Can you go down to Kilgate? <laughs> Somebody <laughs> smash the window. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to ramble into this shot. Oh, I love it. I understand you can't. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Really? Yeah. Fuck yeah. me. The dark art. Um, it's heavy shit, really, man. Um, the reason why I say that is because the awareness that I've kind of come to receive um, on the back of this whole thing. Um, has been a lifetime experience, in all honesty. Um, I'm a pretty troubled soul, really, me. I've been a troubled soul all my life. Uh, I live in two places. My head, you know, is two people. And uh, I've had these issues for literally all my life, what I can remember. I never really knew what it was about. Um, I've always been kind of restless, very unhappy, not with my childhood or any of that. But um, I was, you know, a troubled youth, um, always spending time concentrating on actually making a mark, moving things, and 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 you know, a legacy which is massively important to me. And uh, the realization of this came really 28 years ago when I lost my poor mum, um, a situation that I never got over and experienced, and still haven't done to this day. And then that kind of escalated into another issue that occurred um, when I lost my poor son. Um, and then, uh, well, coming up nearly five years ago, I lost my poor dad. And my family was such a tight unit. Um, the loss of my mum took, just took a massive part out of that unit. Um, and my dad finally finished it. And then five years ago, um, my loving wife of 29 years decided she wanted to fuck off with somebody else. And um, that was really the kind of pinnacle of the whole thing. That just sent me into a place that words can't describe. The priority in those days was actually motorbikes first, beer second though. Women can be third, but they were there. They were there, but it was all about motorbikes and having fun. And within that was the camaraderie, tremendous camaraderie. That was the fun part of it. And we would all help each other out and give each other nicknames. Nick's nickname, Slick. Slick Elliot. That's what we called him. We used to call him Slick because of slick motorbike tyres. And it rhymed obviously with Nick. Slick, and then with those Pete Mindham mudslide shades, yeah. It was all fun and great memories. These little things you remember of, um, of what we used to do in our teenage years. Yeah. In between the fights, in between falling off motorbikes, having crashes, which we did do, um, and scrapes, scrapes with the law. There used to be a couple of hockey uh, goals over there, right over the far side. And one of our pals, uh, Frank by name, uh, used to live in one of the houses that backed onto the school field. So, uh, and we weren't supposed to play in, in the hockey goals because it used to break them. Uh, but there used to be about eight of us over there all playing. And uh, particularly in the evenings when the school teachers were still here, they'd come out and if we saw, if any of us who were playing, saw the teachers coming out of usually the sports area which was here um, one of us would shout and then we'd run like billy -o, jump over the fence and go back into this guy's back garden uh, but the irony of it was they, they knew who we were i mean we we used to go to the school so the next day you'd still get a bollocking in the morning anyway <laughs> because they saw you playing on the school field Good to see you, my friend. Oh, likewise, and thanks for coming in. No problem. Thank you ever so much for the hospitality and inviting me in. I, I can't wait, really. It's a special day for me, this is. There was no. a fantastic stage That's, here. That would have been this whole building in the middle. Would it? Got, got... Right. Because there was a stage. 
an, an honours board gone. which I was on yeah for swimming ah uh, I bet so that's all I bet that's, that's all, all gone that's shame isn't it yeah but I bet that's all yeah what a shame yeah, yeah. yeah. you don't look any older <laughs> I, I feel it I feel it do you know what I'm saying I mean, look at tell you how I feel no I know I know I've been saying yeah <laughs> I do, man. Yeah. It was kicking. Shame. 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 Over the years, some really, really famous people, and it all started here at Stangground. And it was inspired. The reason we come up in particular to art, uh, Mr. Segu's out kind of was head of art, and you, you kind of subject leader, subject leader oh, yeah, in art okay, and everything. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this is where it all began. And this is so his teacher inspired uh, Nick to sort of get into photography and, and, and follow this, this this interesting career path. So it all started at school for him. Just here? Just here. Geographically, this, the art department is in pretty much the same place. Yeah. That's, but think, the pool used to be here. Yeah, because you used to walk out yeah. the back of the art department and then it's I used to go down into the pool. What's it like to be back here, Nick? It's, it's really strange, actually. It's the, mostly the whole place has changed and vastly since I was here. But Gary's been absolutely a top guy today and uh, he's took me around and kind of scratched on parts that I do remember that are still here, the original kind of playing fields. And we went to the pool, which was a big deal for me. I'm going to love this. Good to do, eh? All at six o'clock in the morning, every bloody morning. Good, isn't it? Fantastic. Can the lid on, Yeah, you got it, yeah. Yeah, we're sort of around the corner, then. That's good. Well done. Ah, because... Do you think actually football pitches on the glass and edge? Yeah, that was all the football pitches. Yeah. So I wonder whether that's... We used to climb be... over the fence and come in here yeah, yeah, for yeah. the summer and play football. That's and there was hockey. And, hockey this, and this would there. be where you did your five side. That's it, here. What's it been like to have me and Gary? Uh, really, really good. I mean, uh, it's, always, it's always great to welcome um, any ex-students back. But, you know, somebody like yourself, Nick, who can talk about that journey um, and, and the influence that, 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 that a teacher had on you in those early days, those formative years. Oh, I think gotcha. that's a great thing. And, you know, going around and speaking to the students and being able to kind of relay that message to them was just invaluable. And that there, which I think is a pharmacy now, yeah. that was the grounds one top. Oh, where they kept all the okay. cutting yeah, and yeah, tractors yeah. and all that yeah. stuff in there. Yeah. 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 You keep going. Do you want to keep going? Because you've got the tennis courts yes. down the end. Well, I'm going to really? try and get to the tennis. I've got to say, when I came, I thought, I didn't know what to expect. Okay. From a guy running a gap <laughs> like this, you know. Disappointed but, or? No, 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 okay, no, good, good. Man. <laughs> no, you're, you're a rock and roll dude. You're there. You're there. So how was that, mate? Absolutely brilliant, man. I tell you. The hospitality of, of Gary Carlisle as the principal here, fantastic, well a lovely, lovely man. And it was really quite emotional to come back here, it really was, it's been a long time. Um, I saw my friends were all following this bloke called Nick Elliott Rock Art Photographer, and I thought, who the hell is he? And I looked at his profile picture and I thought, don't know. So I thought, right, well, I'm going to follow him as well and see what it's all about. And before we know it, we're just say, talking, hello, hello, you know, all that sort of rubbish. Have you had a good day? And um, before you know it, we, we we get on like a house on fire. We met in a very, very difficult time uh, for me and for him. And uh, uh, Nick uh, became for me a really special friend. He asked me if I fancied taking on some of the social media, uh, which I was really nervous about. I went, OK, we'll have a go. He seemed to, to trust me. And I also now I'm, I'm also a PA and keep his diary and make sure he's on track and tell him what the weather's going to be like, you know, wherever he's going and basically sort out anything he needs. You know, I'm, I'm there. I, I fell in love with uh, his uh, his work, uh, to talk with people about Nick, uh, with many galleries, many, many radio, many magazine, and uh, um, they uh, started to know Nick now. Does he need to be kept on track then? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, he does. Yeah, in the nicest possible way. We uh, we had a bit of a sliding doors relationship. Um, 
we, uh, he'd sent me a friend request on Facebook and I was, um, for years, we just messaged happy birthday to each other and, um, and then one day he was making a chilli, told me that he'd made this chilli that was really fuck off good and we started talking about chilli and three months later when the planets all aligned and our schedules permitted we met for a coffee which um, lasted 14 hours and we were still telling each other our stories. 14 hour coffee? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was really strange because I accepted his friend request because um, I used to go to school with his cousin and I met his mum and dad when I was 11 at Billing Aquadrome when me and his cousin went away together for a day to Billing and um, all of our friends, we all went in the same circles. So I thought I must have known him at some point and my career started off at EMAP. I used to write for the newspaper and now I write for him. And um, uh, I just thought that we knew each other, but we never actually met during our growing up period until five years ago. Fantastic. Fantastic. Peterborough Lido, fuck me. Or as it was known then, Peterborough Pool. No pool like it on the planet. So when were you last here? Oh dear. 73, 73, 74, round about that time. And what did you do here? I trained here. Um, I trained here a lot when I was swimming um, and I trained most of the time we spent here training for the Olympics 1972 Munich with a guy called Brian Brinkley who then went on to the, uh, to the Munich Games. I missed the time which was a bit of a gas. But Christ man this is a lot of memories and I was a lifeguard here. For one season, I used to sit on this chair here. It was a different chair then, but you know, all this was closed in then. The changing room area was all closed in, but it's all open now. My dad taught me to dive there one Friday night, just there. Just there. What, in the shallow end? Yeah, third lane in. And now I think it was about a fortnight after, I swam the race, total bollocks, I didn't get anywhere, but you know, it was the first the first real taste of what competitive swimming was about. And I was a member here, Peterborough Swimming Club, for years. How was that, mate? Lovely. Coming out, they're the same turnstiles, I think. I think they're the same turnstiles. They're always a bugger to get out where you were dragging your bag. This is the original doors. When did you leave here? <sighs> 70... Nearly 76. You know, I learned a lot here, an awful lot here. You know, how to print properly. Wet room, dark room, developing films you know, newspaper life, and in those days, it was hectic, very hectic, very hectic. It really was. So what did your dad say when you said you were leaving? Christ, he weren't happy at all. He said it was a, a massive, massive big mistake. We met in Nashville, first time I met. He was diving about a recording studio, taking pictures of everybody, upside down, underneath pianos, hiding behind walls. It was quite fascinating to watch actually and um, you know I think both of us were on a sort of mutual you know seeking seeking you may find venture in, in the states so we just kind of we kind of piled up and became very friendly yeah I mean I haven't seen Nick for ages now but I, I always feel as if I he always feels close in some way because he's that kind of person you know yeah 
I don't feel that there's a, much you have to explain to Nick when you do see each other after a while. You know, I've worked with quite a few photographers in my day, obviously from the receiving end of what they do, but you know, uh, some of them are great, uh, but Nick's exceptional. We got together for a meeting and he presented a whole scenario to the band. Uh, it was fresh to everyone's ears at the time and came up with a whole plot, which I have to say was completely achieved from start to finish. And then Nick seemed to get excited. Well, he did get excited about what had happened. And so, as you probably know, there's that the fine art book, which was the, you know, I think it was 10, 10 days one summer or whatever it was. So it was the period at the time. We're in Kings Lynn um, with Dead Reynolds. Um, they're filming a video here for the new single, which comes out in June. And, uh, you know, this is part of the Rocky Ventry. We're just kind of hanging you know, kind of doing a couple of flybys and seeing what we've got. We've uh, already got some nice nice stuff uh, towards the project. Uh, but it's great, it's great, these guys are top draw. Tight in that space, though. It's a little bit tight in that room. Uh, a bit social, made a few new friends. <laughs> but uh, it's not too bad, really. You know, <laughs> that's the kind of uh, concept that they want to show. It's something to do with coming out of the lockdown. Um, and that's really where, the, where the, the single is based. A lot of the new album is based around that kind of, you know, all the issues that we've had being locked down and trapped and all this kind of stuff, you know. Put your, put your arm out, stretch your arm out with the stick, that's it. Got it. But I mean, it would take probably about 18 months to shoot the thing. You know, it's not a quick process to do it. And it's covering off basically their lives, the five guys' lives, what that involves, you know, people around them, families, etc., etc. How they chill, spend time, and obviously work and recording, you know, it covers the whole thing off. Just take half a step to your left. That's it. From when, when you're ready. Just look in at the minute. Okay. Turn and come back to me. I've got two projects that I'm working on at the minute. I call them rockumentaries. Uh, and basically they're a photographic documentation of the man, the artist, his craft and his work and showing the side to this particular artist that nobody ever sees. You know, home life, partner life, uh, uh, you know, performance life, writing, the, the kind of mental anguish of the whole thing. And this kind of uh, is captured in photographic uh, documentation, which again ends up as a rockumentary, which will be a fine art coffee table book. And uh, usually I like to tour these things as well as a, um, a, a placed art piece. We'll come this end in the same room, but I think we're going to turn that in the studio. Yeah, I, so I, I thought actually That's when I saw it, because it's good, isn't it? Don't you to me? Online, actually, on the family favourite, this Facebook, would you believe? Yeah, that's right. I was, yeah, I was a family all work. Um, I'd seen some photos that Nick had done, um, one especially of your dad. Um, and I just like the way you played with the darkness in the photos as well as the light. The darkness in the photos really makes the light part stand out and I think that's, that's incredible. You know? Oh, thank you, man. Oh, really thank you. It. i
do write generally all the time. I come up with two or three songs a day. So I'm quite prolific. So I kind of, I like the fact that next book shows that's that side of me as a as a person rather than just a performer if you know what i mean it's me a bit that's better and the right or no no just keep that's it okay. and just move your right shoulder into the window a bit just kind of lay on here yep as if you're having a snooze all right face knee towards the door all right, cool. all right. so just get yourself comfy If I see something dark, I mean, I feel like I have to write it. I yeah. Mean, I kind of, it, it does feel like it's part of the, part of the process. Yeah, yeah. No, I can um, relate very much to that. Is, is, is that important to you then, Nick, the sort of, the dark side of oh, God, yeah. what you produce? Oh, God, yeah. Where you see, all, all, my, all my work is created from emotion. Uh, there's, I mean, obviously there's a technical side to it, which obviously you have to be able to, you know, kind of master that. But really... Everything I shoot comes from within. It's a bad habit, guys. I know, <laughs> I know it is, but it's fun. So you do some stuff through now. What do you do through now then? I take all the <laughs> I take all the PR shots, um, video, and I write um, press releases, stories for him for Nick Elliott Info, and have done for a while. How do you find that? It's really quite good fun actually. It's um, it's quite nice to get back to a bit of writing as well. And um, there's an awful lot to write about him as well, so it's, it's entertaining. <laughs> Nick has a little bit of OCD, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he does. <laughs> How do you manage that? Do you want to know the truth? <laughs> I don't think you can handle the truth. <laughs> He suffers from OCD terribly, but um, uh, and he knows that he's got it, and he tries to control it. But the more that he tries to control it, the more that it kind of messes with his inner psyche. So you just let Nick have to do what he does all the time: OCD, putting cushions and leveling up his pictures. <laughs> and um, you just have to allow him to do that and then the day can go great. <laughs> do you think because of his OCD that's why his, his pictures are so bang on? Definitely. He's not happy unless something is 110% right for him and that is driven by his artistic creations and also part of his OCD as well that he has to get things right and if he doesn't get it right it just gnaws away at him all the time and so you have to allow him to do that to get things right and to do things in his routine during the day in order for him to feel comfortable during the day actually it, it worries him really worries him um, and that transition. I mean, I kind of made again the conscious, you know, decision that it, this had to be done. It, it was literally a thing that I needed to tick that box before the end came. Um, so I, I'm still very much involved in the music business. But it's it's even more kind of avant-garde and bespoke than it was before. And I call this my Ziggy years. When Bowie left and killed off Ziggy, he then moved in to be the true creative genius that he became. I came into his life where his mental health wasn't 100%. And um, it was the aftermath of... Um, 
attempting suicide. I just didn't know what to do. For me, um, I put this kind of tag on the whole event. I titled it um, No Date Shun Side of September, um, which was basically I was going to kill myself. For me, this was real. I'm the kind of person that I, I don't talk about shit, I do it. And so, Basically, literally what I decided to do, that with it, and, I, and it would be death by hanging. Um, How did you approach that? Well, uh, like I say, I, I did a lot of research. I know that sounds completely silly, but that's what I did. Um, because what I wanted to do, I wanted to document the event, the whole thing, from start to finish, which is literally what happened. And um, we arranged it. Um, and Who's I. We? Well, it was, a, it was my best friend, a guy called Lindsay Barn. Um, and me and Linz talked in massive depth, planned it all out, exactly what would go on. And because obviously, you know, once I was in the point of where I was essentially on the point of dying, um, there was nobody there to shoot the thing. So the brief was that Linz would shoot whatever happened. And that was the strict rule. Whatever happened, he shot it. I settled in North Norfolk about uh, 15 years ago. Got uh, really pissed off with what was going on in uh, the UK, really, Andy. So moved here for a bit of quality of life. That's what it's all about, quality of life at the end of the day. And uh, we find ourselves at Wells Next to Sea today, which is minging with everything I tried to run away from. I work all over the place, though, all across the UK, across the world, you know, so it doesn't really matter. Norfolk has a vibe when you can find the space and the holes, you know. Unfortunately, a lot of that vibe goes away when the centre of, you know, society as it is now comes over here to have weekends and days out. I know, I mean, we all did it. As, as children, we did the same thing. But, you know, things seem a lot, lot better in those days. Is it important for you to be in the right environment when you're working, when you're creating? It's very important for me to live in that space, yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, working in the rock world as I have done, you know, you could be at a festival like, you know, Sonosphere, when I did the stuff with Iron Maid and Metallica. You know, you're talking 160,000 people. You know, it's, it's madness. I started representing him in the UK with um, getting him um, contracts to photograph various artists for album covers and for for publicity shots. I go to Nashville all the time, and it was probably about 2010. Um, I said to Nick, well, look, I'm off to Nashville for a week. Do you want to come for the crack? <laughs> you know, basically, I was running some shows in Nashville. It was all around the um, uh, CMA Awards in November of that year. And uh, yeah, he said that'd be good for a giggle. So we went with Sandy from Marmalade and we met up with a couple of other British artists that live in Nashville and we had a great week. You know, we did, we did the shows, we did lots of radio, some TV and uh, introduced Nick to the American scene, which he caught the bug very quickly, you know. And, it, and people love Nick. I mean, we were going everywhere. We were going into restaurants and people were, you know, the waitresses were leaving their number on his, by the side of his his table. And then, you know, and you're sitting at a table with quite highly revered, I'm just calling him a DJ, but, you know, radio station owner, presenter, and, and myself and another guy that was a recording, I mean, recording artist and, Nick would be the one getting all the attention. <laughs> so, uh, so he said, well, you, you should look after my interests in America, which is what I do. So what was Nick's dress sense like uh, then compared to now? Oh, crikey me. Uh, that's a totally different thing now. <laughs> He's evolved, hasn't he? <laughs> no, he was a, I, I'm guessing he, he was a conformist then because... Um, um, I mean, that would have been school uniform days. Yeah, I've always placed a lot of emphasis on my image. Um, it's something that I've just always had from being, you know, a teenager, really. 
Um, I think it's important to look good. Certainly in the business that I'm in, um, it's important to look good. Plus, I think it's a statement, artistic statement, or it is to me. Flamboyant, um, very much out there. It's obviously a, uh, an expression of how he feels. And um, I think it's great because um, he takes longer <laughs> to get ready than I do. Whatever he's doing, he dresses the part. He's more like a rock star than the rock stars he plays to us. <laughs> 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 I would always say to him, what are you going to wear? You know, what are you going to wear tonight for this gig? Well, I've not decided yet, but, you know, yeah, I like to see what he wears. He's, he's got some great clothes. He's got to stand out because of what he does for a living. Yeah, it ain't no good... Well, a pair of flip-flops and a pink shirt, by the way, I don't know. It's something that I, I use to as an expression. And... Uh, it allows me to kind of just push the line and produce an individuality, which is what my my whole art is all about. This is own fashion, you know? I mean, who knows what he's going to be in the next day? So I think that's half of his um, attraction, is that you just don't know. It's not about com compliance with anything or conformism at all. You know, it's about being totally an individual, a one-off. His dress sense, well, that's developed over the years, as he has. Um, very much in the old days, it was T-shirt and Levi 501s. That was it. And uh, But now it's a lot more flamboyant. And Nick can get away. I know what he likes. He can get away. It's not my style at all. But that doesn't matter. It's us, Nick Elliott. We're in Norwich, and we're at Norwich Nick, named after me. Not really, but uh, what a foreboding fucking place this is, Jesus Christ. You certainly wouldn't want to mess with the dibbles and end up having a bit of a holiday over here. Look at Christopher Levi. Eighteen eighty-six on the wall, so. Bloody hell, I bet it was a mean place in 19, well, 1886. Really. So when are you going to give up smoking? Soon. I started uh, after 20 years, but uh, I'll, I'll hit it on the head. I will. I've got COPD, so, you know, breathing was an optional extra before I started the cigarettes. Now, good breath once a week, and I've done well, you know. But... Uh, it's a, it's a creative thing. Damp as a hooker's briefs. <coughs> One of the reasons that I came to move to Norfolk was really Norwich is seriously on the map for, for music, certainly for my genre. I mean, we've got the venues here, UEA and the waterfront. And uh, I did some stuff with Thin Lizzy here, uh, which they used it as a warm up gig uh, when I was on tour with those guys. Um, and also uh, Motorhead, I did some stuff here with. A couple of years ago, uh, the legend that is Earl Slick wanted to go shopping, so we went shopping in Norwich. And Norwich really didn't know what day of the week it was when, when we went shopping, me and Slick. But we went in the Doc Martin shop, which is pretty good actually in Norwich. We walked in, it's got like one door in, one door out and the whole place just came gathering around because they wanted to know who it was. And, you know, they were young people but didn't recognise who Earl Slick was. You know, so it was, it was really good fun. And uh, then we went out salmon because he's big time into salmon. A small interlude on the broads on a Wednesday. And it's quite nice, the weather's good, the sun's out, it's just come out. It's been bloody cold up, up until then. But uh, we're here at the, um, it's the ferry house. We don't really know where it is, apart from it's on the river. And it's really nice, and we're going to just stop off here and grab a bit of lunch, have a few tizers, uh, a couple of JDs, and uh, we'll be away. Happy days.
great, absolutely brilliant. I love it, man. I really do. I think it's absolutely top draw away the patchy time. It really is. I've always been into them, but um, like I say, never really been able to get near the things and you know actually experience what it's all about. I'm hugging the coastline. <laughs> River Bank in this case. Yeah, to Mumford Hall, uh, DMH, to the people that used to regularly come here. I spent many, many weekends here, many weekends, seeing bands, and uh, I saw some shows here that literally changed my life. Rory Gallagher three times. Yes, uh, Wishbone Ash, the list goes on. And uh, it always played a big part. This was pretty much my weekends, really would be split between London, DMH in Leicester, or Cambridge Court Exchange, and they were the three venues that I kind of spent most of my youth, if that's what you want to call it. There's some legendary names here. Hollies, fantastic man. Not the original band, because a couple of them are dead, which is a bit of a shame, but at the time, in its day, it still is, but in its day, this, this really was a life-changing venue. A really, really big part of the history because I came here to see Yes, which was one of my all-time favorite bands. And we came really early in the morning and sat there for 10 hours in the rain, on and off, waiting to get in to be the first at the front of the stage. That was before you had barriers and safety barriers and mosh pits and all that. You just pushed straight up against the stage. Let's go and find Rick. <laughs> hey, what about Rick Wakeman, yeah? Yeah, Rick Wakeman. Legend, absolute legend. Incredibly funny guy, but I was lucky enough to meet him two or three times when I was working with Planet Rock. And uh, he was heavily involved in Planet Rock Radio. Used to do a Saturday morning show, which was a complete riot. Um, but uh, we did a couple of festivals together. And uh, it, it, was, it was one of them kind of fanzine things. I don't usually do that, but for Rick Wakeman, you got autographs and stuff. You had your picture taken with him, you know, it was fantastic. Heading backstage, which is also a very special place. I met a lot, a lot of legendary artists here. So you sat here with Amy Winehouse? Yeah, I sat here with Amy Winehouse. Um, it was one of the Summer Sunday festivals and uh, we talked about the moon. Don't know why. Uh, this was in the early part of her career, so I think she just released the EP Black, I think it was. We just spent probably about 25 minutes just chatting about the moon and space and all that kind of stuff, which I think at the time she was pretty much into, big time. And uh, then it was pretty much the same location where I sat and had a cup of tea with Chrissy Hind. Well, I didn't have the tea because I don't drink tea, but she did. And uh, they, a lot of the guys used to come out here where they were kind of waiting, you know, just kind of kicking back and getting a bit of, bit of the vibe, you know, and, or they'd have a tab or whatever it was, you know. So I used to catch up with a lot of people out here. This place was always so intimate and this changing room, I think last time I was in here, may have been with fish. There's a big stage, it was always a big stage. <laughs> Animals, I did some stuff with the animals here. Blockheads. So has it changed much since you... Um... It has a bit. Um, this car park and that wasn't here. And uh, for the Summer Sunday festivals, the main stage was there. And... Uh, I fulfilled a dream here, actually, because one of my favourite bands of all time was Supertramp, and uh, they headlined here 201, and I worked on the tour, and uh, I got a T-shirt from the band, which I've still got to this day, and it was that was a serious feather in the cap for me, it was. What sort of influence did this place have on your career? Uh, on my career, massively, massively. Um, one of the first kind of big commercial music gigs that I had was here um, and was commissioned by DMH 
um, by a guy called Mark Merrifield, actually. Fantastic lad who was marketing guy here. And that was for a Judy Zoot show. And that was the first show that I shot here. And that was commissioned by DMH. So really, I, I'd, probably, I'd, I'd probably credit this place to being one of the very first places that started me, certainly on the live stuff. Um, it was really de Montfordal. So we planned it, we put it together. It was done in my matrimonial home because I thought it was the place where it needed to be and that's where I lived at the time. Because for me, that's where it all stopped. It all came to an end there one Sunday, uh, early November. And we did the whole thing. We did the whole thing. Right the way from documented from the start to the finish, uh, my last meal, um, notes, various notes that I left. Um, not suicide notes, but they were things that I needed to say. So were you intending to kill yourself? Oh, categorically. Categorically, man. Categorically. That, 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 there, was no, there was no way back. It, it, was, it was the end of the line for Nick Elliott. But, but you see, I didn't give a fuck. I really didn't give a fuck. And to be honest, I think on reflection, that has very much contributed to the art of where I am now with what I'm doing, because I no longer care. I know that's a very broad statement, but to get to do the stuff and to shoot the projects that I have shot in the past five years and what I continue to do, I can't afford to care. When I say that, I mean, um, I'm not interested in views, opinions, people's attitudes. I'm not interested in that at all. This is not a rebellious kickback at life. It's about creating something that is so real, so touchable, so tangible, that for me, it's uh, exorcism. It's liberating. That's what it is, where I am now. Do you worry about what people think? No, not at all. Um, and I'm not being ignorant in that. I'm not being a Bolshevik or, or, or not fucking interested in what people's views are. Because if somebody has a view, I look on it that, that I, then my work here is done. The Social Distancing Festival, first festival I've actually done for over a year. Obviously because of the COVID situation, you know, it's been very, very bad. Uh, the arts, music world has suffered big time, you know, everybody's kind of struggling with everything. Yeah, nobody's working, nobody's earning jack shit. This one I got invited to because there was a couple of bands on over the weekend that I'm possibly doing some rockumentary projects with. And this one, um, was basically put together in six weeks. It's a festival called the Social Distancing Festival in Norfolk. It's put on by a good friend of mine called Tristan Finnis, who uh, really kind of, he's heavily involved in the Festival 2 um, shows that they do every year. So chewing gum sets you up, does it? Yeah, chewing gum. I've always chewed. Uh, it helps when I shoot. Just makes you think, you know, because it's a bit of a zone when you get inside there doing your shit, you know. And uh, it just helps things move along in my head. I tend to blank out things a lot when I go in there. When I do a lot of live stuff, you can have a lot of guys in the pit, you know, shooting away. It can be quite horrific, very busy and uh, not a lot of room, it's all very hectic. I just find that chewing helps, that's what it's about really. Focus. Focus. Hi guys, Nick Elliott, Rock Art Photographer, and we're in big London town. I'm showing here tonight at the Coppel X Centre. Uh, got a little bit of a private viewing going on uh, for a show that's gonna run for the next 10 days here in uh, Piccadilly. So, uh, if you can make the show, that'd be really good. Come along, see what I do, and uh, let's make some art. They might undress themselves publicly, but stay as that person. I've still got the portfolio. I've got all the test shots that uh, I, I, that I bought from you. Yeah. All yeah. of that. And if, but if it wasn't for him, I'd, 
I wouldn't have just evolved into, you know, it's almost a dichotomy, the fucking pirate and the alcoholic. <laughs> Lindsay took really pretty much a back seat. He literally just shot the whole thing when I told him to shoot it. And I went through the process of what my last day was, exactly what it was. So that would be breakfast, cup of coffee, you know, that kind of thing. Um, pacing up and down. And then the particular way which you put the rope over the door, um, it was fixed uh, like yon side of the door opposite side to where I intended on hanging myself. Um, it had to be fixed around the handle. I went into the room um, on my own, put the rope around my neck, and I, I'm naked because I wanted to take it right back to the day that I came into life, I was gonna go out under the same circs. And, and then Linz came in, and literally, the, as I said, the brief was, Linz, you shoot it, shoot whatever it was. Whatever happens from now on. I put the rope around my neck, I sat on the stool, and then literally I just dropped off the side of the stool, and that was it. What's happening today then, mate? Well, uh, this is shoot day. Uh, we're off to a place that uh, is an old ruin, a military barrack. Uh, that's the first place that we're going to kind of check out. Not too far away from here. Um, we're in Kenmere, um, which is Southern Ireland. And a uh, lovely little place, actually. We've just had a very uh, sensible Eng well, English come Irish breakfast for Monty. And uh, so we're going to hopefully get something in the can today. Here we are at uh, Mulgrave Barracks, Republic of Ireland, County Kerry, on Sam Collins from Molecule, E Molecule. Can't even pronounce my band name properly. And uh, well, Kelly's hiding in the tower. Kelly's in the tower. Uh, yeah, no steps there, Kel. That's a cool shot, though. Actually, looking up. Well. Look at this. Look at that, eh? Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, we're here to do a photo shoot with Nick Elliott. And, oh, shit. And, uh, that comes in the territory, really. Yeah. If, but I kind of like the idea of open arms. Yeah, I do. Um, and then I could wear a shirt or I could not wear a shirt. Yeah, I think maybe you should switch it up. Maybe let's do yeah. some wing. Yeah. What, without the, Sorry, so the, the body warmer? Oh, no, with the, the, the long sleeves. Yeah. So. A little too much? Yeah, I think halfway, halfway would do. Yeah, oh, I see. That's side. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. What do you reckon? It sounds great. Happy with that? Yep. How's the day going so far, Simon? Good, yeah, much better. Started off very, very rough indeed. Uh, yeah. Carlo. Then my mum walked in, uh, she's got keys to the my spot, and I was fucking like, like naked on the couch. So right. that, that uh, was, that, was that? Right. Yeah, so that, that wasn't a good start. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, it's never a good start when your mum sees you naked. <laughs> yeah. One more. That's good, Cal, move if you need to. That's nice, that's lovely. And again. That's good. It seemed to be very quick from literally saying, Linz, shoot the fucker, shoot it, whatever. And, you know, there was the debate between, well, I, I no, I'm gonna start, I, no, you shoot it. Let, let, let it go as it's gonna go. God will make the decision. And then, uh, and as it was, I think he did, because I do recall um, where this is in psyche or whatever deep in my mind, I do recall when I slipped into the unconsciousness, um, I saw my mum come into the room. Mum walked from right to left in the frame and she walked into the room 
and then suddenly uh, there was there was some kind of words were exchanged, but I couldn't tell you what they were. But it was definitely Mum, um, and I could see her. She was there. You know, I'm a great believer in that kind of stuff, and I saw it. And at that time, I I had no conscious state at all. I didn't know what was going on. And the next thing I know, uh, Lindsay was literally holding me up, taking the tension out of the rope. I remember him ringing and saying he's okay, but the, the stool he was sitting on slipped. And it, he started to die. He started to die. He started to literally hang it himself. And he was okay. He was okay. But if Lindsay hadn't have been there, which was his friend, if Lindsay hadn't have been there, he'd be dead. He, he grabbed hold of me around my arms. That's where I, where I remember coming, you know, round. And the rope, it was still around my neck, but he pulled it so it didn't choke on my neck. And he was also holding my body up, which was dead weight, um, to stop the tension on the rope. And then he managed to get it, the rope off. Um, and I just literally fell to the floor. I was in a right state. So did Lindsay decide not to let it happen? Yes. Yeah, Lin, Lin's made that decision, um, which um, that's a strange one because um, the brief was let it happen, let it happen. But Lin's said no, you know, where where he is my best friend and and he went in to to do what he needed to do, and without a doubt, Lindsay Barnes saved my life. There's no question about it. I came into his life where his mental health wasn't 100% and um, it was the aftermath of um, attempting suicide and um, it was picking through his brains and picking through all of his feelings and emotions and spiritual feelings, um, picking through all those and trying to make sense of everything that happened in his life, even as a child growing up um, in his marriage and then where he was now and then just trying to help him make sense of all that. How do you see where Nick is going to progress in the future? He's extremely driven by his experiences but I think that he will always be driven and his art has taken a remarkably different course of events because of events that have happened in his life. It kind of runs parallel to, his art kind of runs parallel to his, um, to his life, really. My name's Nick Elliott, world-renowned rock art photographer, and I'm coming to America to meet you. And I'm gonna come with a few of my friends here. This is just a small example of some of the iconic artists that I've worked with over my lifetime, dedicating my life to the art. And me and the guys are going to come over and we're going to tour the US and we're going to do a really special, exciting show. A very up close and personal thing. There'll be a lot of meet and greets, staffing exhibitions, a Q&A in front of a live audience which will give you guys the opportunity to ask some questions and learn about what it's like to spend your time and your life with these kind of artists. And also, you know, to hear some of the backstage, some of the filth, some of the dirt, man, you know, and uh, on what it's all about. I'm mad for it. I'm so excited about coming over there, spending some time with you guys. I really can't wait. So make sure you come and see the shows. Let's spend some time together, meet and greets, up close and personal, and let's have a few laughs, bit of giggles. You know what I'm saying? Sex, drugs, rock and roll. You, you can see how, what kind of effect he has on people and how, how great he is at his craft. Huh? He's a free spirit uh, and he can do what he wants to do, can't he? And he, he, he knows what that shot is and I think that's part instinct um, and part visualisation. So it brings together that creativity, it brings together that focus, it brings together that vision, um, and I guess it brings together that, that impatience. As a performer, I can tell how they feel from your photos. Yeah, he's a lot more outlandish and rock and roll than he was. But that's developed over the years. Um, his sense of humour hasn't developed, though. 
So to get to where I am now, to get right inside, it, it's just, it's cosmic, man, for me. It's just cosmic, you know, but um, I don't know. It, it's, it's been, it's been a rough trip, but it's been a good trip, without a doubt. Would I do it again? Yeah, I would, categorically. Um, but uh, I may well do it a little differently. But yeah, I'd do the fucker again, no two ways.